Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for coming. I'm Michael Schuldice, Senior Recruitment Officer at Athabasca University. Proud partner of the... Thank you. Proud partner of the CFLPA and supporter of the CFL. Athabasca University and the CFL welcome fans at Mark CFL Week Fan Fest to a football conversation for the ages. Three generations of quarterback greatness, the legendary Warren Moon, the incomparable Anthony Calvillo, and the dynamic Mike Riley are going to join TSN's Rod Smith in a discussion about achieving greatness and overcoming obstacles. Athabasca University is a world-class leader in distance education. And these football leaders wrote the book on distance, the record book. In total, this trio has thrown an incredible 166,602 yards in professional football. So to convert that into Saskatchewan, that's 152K, or the distance from here to Willowbrook. They've thrown a football. <laughs> Athabasca University helps students of all ages and backgrounds achieve their goals, and Moon, Calvillo, and Riley rank among great CFL quarterbacks of all time, and they'll be talking about achieving their goals with Rod Smith in a little bit. Moon played in the CFL and the NFL for an astounding 22 years, throwing 70,553 yards and 435 touchdowns. He won five straight Grey Cups with the Edmonton Eskimos from 1978 to 1983 before continuing his excellent play in the NFL, where he made the Pro Bowl nine times and was selected by his fellow players as a league MVP in 1990. In a 20-year CFL career, Carville threw for 79,816 yards, which makes him Pro Football's all-time passing leader, when he threw for 455 touchdowns. He was Grey Cup champion three times, and CFL's most outstanding player three times, and a CFL All-Star five times. And as you know, last night he was inducted in the CFL Hall of Fame. At age 32, Riley is one of the top quarterbacks in today's CFL, and the only member of our trio still playing. He joined the CFL with BC in 2010, and became a starter in Edmonton in 2013. He's already thrown for 16,233 yards, and including an astounding 5,554 yards last season when he completed 71% of his passes. A Grey Cup champion in 2011 and 2015, he's also lead, uh, the Grey Cup MVP two years ago. Athabasca University is dedicated to the removal of barriers that restrict access to and success in higher education. Despite their incredible achievements, what might be most impressive about Moon, Calvillo, and Riley is the courage and perseverance, per perseverance sorry, that they've displayed in overcoming obstacles that they've faced in their lives and careers. Time and again, Riley has proved doubters wrong and worked hard to overcome injuries. In college, he was a fifth-string quarterback at Washington State before he transferred to a smaller school, Central Washington, where he earned national recognition. He completed 10 of 15 passes in an NFL preseason game, but was released by several teams before landing in the CFL as a third stringer. When he finally got a chance to start a game, he threw for 276 yards and led the BC Lions to a resounding win over the Edmonton Eskimos. That prompted the Esks to trade for Riley and the rest of CFL history. But that doesn't mean even his recent success has come easily. In 2014, he played a playoff game with a broken bone in his foot, and the following year, he missed eight straight games due to injury, only to come back to lead his team to eight straight wins. Born in one of the poorest parts of Los Angeles, Calvillo had already beaten enormous odds to make it to the CFL. He was looking to resurrect his career when he joined the Montreal Alouettes in 1998, signing as a backup before he took over the team and reached heights never before seen in the CFL. But the courage shown by him and his family off the field are even more remarkable. When Calvillo's wife Alexia was diagnosed with cancer in 2007, a week after giving birth to their second child, he left the Owls to care for his family. He returned the following year to lead the team to back-to-back Grey Cup championships. Moments after winning the 2010 Grey Cup, Calvillo revealed that doctors had informed him they had discovered a cancerous lesion on his thyroid. Today, as cancer survivors, Anthony and Alexia act actively support families fighting their own battle with the disease. Warren Moon lost his father, Harold, to liver disease when Warren was only seven, leaving his mom, Pat, to raise him and his six sisters on her own. Moon, who excelled in high school quarterback in Los Angeles, went on to the University of Washington, where he warmed the bench for a year and was actually booed by his team's own fans the next season. In his senior year in 1977, he had an MVP season, leading the Huskies to a Pac-8 title and a huge triumph in the Rose Bowl. But the biggest obstacle facing black quarterbacks in that era, racism, proved formidable. The CFL gave him the opportunity the NFL did not. Five years and five Grey Cups later, seven NFL teams bid for his services. Moon, Calvillo, and Riley, achieving excellence, overcoming obstacles, 
and likely to inspire all of us as much as their careers have enthralled us. And they talked to Rod Smith for uh, a little bit right now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. One of the great joys I have is working as host of the CFL on TSN, and I am unbiased. I love the league. Just I me mean, this one indulgence. I'm here, and this is great. Go Ryder! Thank you. I, I, w I was always taught in public speaking the best way to start is to warm up the crowd a little bit, and I couldn't think of anything better than that. You know, normally I would say welcome, but instead I should turn it around and say thank you for the welcome. This has been a remarkable week, and I cannot think of a better place to be talking CFL football than right here in the heart of it in Saskatchewan. And I love the chance to talk about football, not just the present day players, but those of the past greats as well. I've been a fan for over 50 years, and I can remember the different eras, and we're going to touch on them now. Three different eras of the Canadian Football League, but they all have one thing in common. A couple of things, actually. They were great, and in one case still is great, but also they have overcome obstacles. One of the themes here of Athabasca University, achieving success and overcoming obstacles goes along the way. And I would like to begin with a man who is one of the greatest ever to play the game, north of the border, south of the border as well. We commissioned a poll on TSN 11 years ago of the top 50 players in the history of the Canadian Football League, and despite playing only six years, this man ranked the top five. He ranked fifth. But he would have been much higher than that, I'm sure, had he stayed. Instead, he went to the National Football League. But before he did, he came out of the University of Washington, undrafted in the NFL, despite being a college star. And he came to the Canadian football with the Edmonton Eskimos and was a part of the greatest dynasty the CFL has seen. The Eskimos won five straight Grey Cups. He was a part of that. And he was the outstanding player in the league in his uh, final year in the CFL before going to the National Football League. Lots more to talk about. I'm really looking forward to talking about the career of the great Warren Moon. Warren? Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think I've ever been applauded in Regina. Every time I came here, they booed me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we were going to get into that, too. So. Um, and, and with our other guests coming up as well, but uh, a, a remarkable career. And I think, you know, people here, especially the diehard CFL fans, they know what you did with the Edmonton Eskimos. But talk about overcoming obstacles and, and your childhood. And I understand you lost your father at a very early age. Just tell me how, how difficult are the challenges that you faced growing up and uh, how the sport of football helped you. Well, like you said, my dad passed away when I was seven years old, and I come from a home where I had my mom and I had six sisters, believe it or not. So it was me in a house with all women, and I became like the, uh, the mature man of the house at a very, very young age. So I matured a lot quicker than, than a lot of boys did at my age, and my mother got me involved in sports just to kind of keep me around other boys, to keep me around mentors, men in my life, coaches and that. So those coaches became kind of my father figures in my life and um, it was it was great because sports teaches you so many great lessons about you know hard work about setting goals about overcoming obstacles about uh, perseverance and all the different things it teaches you so it really helped me as far as my advancement because uh, I needed those things in my life especially from where I came from in the neighborhoods where I came from it was a, a very gang infested neighborhood so I could have easily kind of went that direction if, um, if I wasn't focused in the right direction. And those coaches kept me focused in the right things. My mother kept me involved in the right type of projects, whether it was the Cub Scouts, whether it was the Boys Club, uh, Vacation Bible School in the summertime, whatever it was to keep me on the straight and narrow, that's what she tried to do with me so she didn't lose me to, you know, some of the other bad elements in the area. But I really loved sports, and uh, I was a very hard worker because... I watched how my mom took care of our family, how she went back to school, she re-educated herself, uh, became a private duty nurse. You know, she'd work two shifts, 
made sure she, we always had hot meals on the table, clean clothes on our back. So I never really felt like I was poor uh, because she always was able to provide for me as far as if I wanted to play a sport, she somehow found the money to uh, get me the equipment that I needed, whatever it was. So I, I saw how she maneuvered our family and made every penny count and her work ethic. And I think that work ethic really uh, rubbed off on me. And one of the, uh, my motivations was to make it in life so I could take care of her. And that, that was one of my strong motivations to, uh, to make it a professional athlete. And I wasn't going to let anything get in the way, whether it was, um, you know, people saying I wasn't good enough, people saying that my skin color was too dark, whatever it was, I was going to keep going towards my goal. And I wasn't going to take my eyes off of it because I knew I was good enough to do it. It was just a matter of getting that opportunity. And that opportunity came when I came out of college. Um, with the CFL because the NFL didn't uh, didn't think I could play quarterback wanted me to change positions Yeah, I, I was say, and you wouldn't think so at a time now things have changed a lot, but there weren't uh, Many black quarterbacks at all in the National Football League now. I do remember a time in the CFL before you came in I remember of course uh, the late Bernie Custis, who just passed away recently was the first and and a time with the Hampton Tiger Cats in the early 70s Chuck Ely later Rich Holloway had been a star at Tennessee um, it, it, what did the CFL represent to you? When you went undrafted, and you were a star at Washington Huskies, you'd won the Rose Bowl in 1978. So heading into the 78 pro season, and the NFL, as you had talked about, excuse me, the NFL, as you had talked about, wasn't providing you that opportunity. So how did it come about that you came to Canada? Well, Hugh Campbell, who was our head coach at that time, you know, he had went to Washington State, so he was very familiar with, with the Washington area. And, you know, he followed my career. And um, he came and met with me and said uh, he, he thought I could play professional football as a quarterback. So we sat down. We watched a lot of tape together. We talked a lot about the CFL because I didn't know a whole lot about the league in general. I just knew that a lot of African-American quarterbacks that had had great careers had somehow went up to Canada and, and was, were able to give an, were given opportunities to play quarterback up here. Like guys like you talked about, Condridge Holloway, a guy that I really looked up to when I was in high school, had come up here, Chuck Ely. Uh, Charlie Stevens, I mean, I can go on and on, Jimmy Jones, all the different guys that had gotten opportunities up here. So I had a big decision to make whether I wanted to give up my dream of playing in the NFL, which was something I dreamed of as a kid, just like kids in Canada probably dream of playing in the NHL or whatever, or go to the Canadian Football League, a place where I didn't know a whole lot about, but they were giving me a chance to play the position that I loved, and they were giving me a chance to play professional football, but even though it was in a country I, I didn't have a lot of uh, history with. So... It was a big decision for me, but I'm glad I made that, that decision because it was one of the best decisions of my life at that time. I, I played with probably one of the greatest, like you said, um, professional football teams ever as far as winning. I don't think anybody will ever win five straight Grey Cups again or five straight championships in any sport again just because of the way sports are set up right now. And I didn't realize how special that was when we were doing it. Because you're in it, and you and you just don't you just live in the live in the moment. But once you've gone away from it and seen what other teams have tried to do since what you've done, you realize how special it was of, the, of a time that it was in my life. And so I'll always remember that time in my life. I'll always have a great uh, appreciation for this country, for this league up here, and that's why I'm here today because I want to give back as much as I can and. Uh, in any way I can to help this league keep flourishing because it's a great league. It gives a lot of great opportunities. And, um, you know, Commissioner Orridge is doing a great job right now of trying to expand it to another level. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here to try and help him do that. And he has it out, too, when he took over the job. Uh, you know, he's an American from Queens, New York, and he knew of you and his father knew of you, and, 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 and you helped inspire him, which must mean something to you. It really does, because you never know who you're affecting or who you're inspiring when you're out there playing. Because I'm playing a game that I loved as a kid. I'm trying to play it the best I can. I'm trying to um, conduct myself in the classiest way that I can as far as my character and my integrity. Because I know there are a lot of young kids out there watching you. You're very impressionable about how you carry yourself. So I, I was very conscious of that, but you still never know who you're affecting. And to know that I affected a guy that ends up being the commissioner of uh, the, the CFL was, uh, you know, was quite flattering to me. And like I said, I'm glad I'm able to uh, you know, give back to this league because it gave so much to me. Right. I, uh, I, I, before moving on from the Eskimos, there, there are a few things that I do want to touch upon. You arrived there in 1978, and I remember the way that team was growing. It was star-studded. Tom Wilkinson, Wilkie, was a, a good veteran quarterback, 
and I'm sure was able to teach you some things about the Canadian game, but talk about coming in at the right moment to have a great budding superstar quarterback on a team that was just so full of stars. And I, and I should point out as well, so sadly, our condolences to the family of Larry Hybaugh. Here I get to finally a chance to talk to you when a former teammate of yours and just a tremendous star, so many stars in that team, sadly passing away yesterday. But I just, I, I, I want to ask you about your memories of the players you were with and you talked about you weren't really aware at the time, you know, how special that organization was coming in and all the championships you'd be getting. Yeah, it was a great time. And like you said, we had great players on that football team. A lot of veteran players that I didn't have to worry about coming in there as a young player and carrying the weight of the football team on my shoulders. We had great leadership at all different levels. You know, Dan Kepley, our middle linebacker, was a, was a very emotional leader. We had Dave Fennell, who was known as Dr. Death. Dr. I mean, Death. he just kind of controlled the defensive line. Um, great offensive players. Tom Wilkinson, you know, I credit him a lot for my success early because he taught me the league. He taught me the rule changes, the strategy, how to study to get ready to play for play in a game. And we had a great combination of, of uh, his style and my style that teams had to try and prepare for because we were two different, totally different styles that made it tough for teams with them only a week to prepare, had to prepare for us. So, you know, Tom would start off the game in his style, then all of a sudden I'm coming in there with my style, and their defenses had to change. So it was a, it was a great uh, one-two combination that we had, and um, great talent on our offensive side of the ball. Jim Germany, one of the best backs, I think, yeah. to play up here. I had Brian Kelly, Waddell Smith, Tommy Scott as, as receivers. I mean, it was just a, a lot of talent on a, on a, uh, a football team that, they really knew how to win. When, when it was time to win in a football game, we just had that look in our eyes that everybody knew it was time to step up our game. And when you're playing and winning as much as we did, every stadium you went to, everybody wanted to knock you off. So we knew we had to be on our best every weekend. And it, and it didn't always happen, but when it was time for it to happen, we made sure we stepped our game up and did what we needed to do. And that, that's, that was the great thing about playing for our football team is we were very close on the field, but even closer off the field. We spent a lot of time together, our families in that. So that's one of the reasons why we winning time is what we called it. Uh, whenever, whenever it was winning time, we knew what that time was because of the closeness that we had shared both on and off the field throughout all those years. I, when the, the dynasty, as I say, it's remarkable. It starts in 1978 with a victory over Montreal, beating the Alouettes again in 79. Uh, I believe you started after that, or I, I can't remember, I know you played and played well in the 79 game, and, and, but started in 80, 81, 82 Grey Cup games. Yeah. And, and as I just was just going to say, and as I say, I'm not declaring bias, I was a, I was a Rough Rider fan. That was the old <laughs> Ottawa Rough Riders. I grew up in Ottawa, and I remember a game in 1981, and you guys, and the irony was, that was uh, your greatest regular season, I think it, was, it still it remains the greatest regular season by winning percentage in league history. Calgary came close, 14-1-1, one and, one, and then you play this Ottawa team that won only five games that year in 81. It was, it was led by J.C. Watts, and they're leading 20 nothing or 20-1 to one at the half, and it was almost like this great juggernaut. You, you're so accustomed to winning. It becomes so routine. I, I don't know, was it, what was that first half like when you were so, one of the biggest... I, biggest favorites, I guess, in Great Cup Yeah, history. I think that's one of the few times we really went into a game a little bit too overconfident, that we were such big under, I mean, big favorites in the game. Everybody kept talking about how it wasn't going to be a game because of Ottawa's regular season record. Uh, it was a very cold and kind of a um, sleety type of day in Montreal that, that day, and we had a tough time just with our footing, throwing the football, things like that, and J.C. Watts was all over the place running around and scrambling and making plays, and we found ourselves down 20 to 1 at halftime, but we went in at halftime, we regrouped. Again, it was winning time, and everybody, we had a couple of guys give up, stand up and give speeches, and, and next thing you know, we went out there on the field, and uh, we scored 21 unanswered points in one football game, and, and uh, that's what it takes. You, you, you've got you to gotta not only have games like we had in, in uh, Great Cups where we won in like 48 to 15 or whatever, but you're also going to have tight games like that, and, and we were able to win any type of game that we needed to play at that time, and again, that's what made it so great playing on those football teams, because it didn't matter the circumstances, we were going to find a way to pull the game out when we needed to. Yeah, and thanks for breaking Ottawa hearts, by the way, we appreciate that. <laughs> the following year in the rain at Exhibition Stadium, I remember then that was the capped off the drive, uh, beating the Toronto Argonauts 32-16, and by then, the only thing you wonder when it, it must get harder and harder to sustain this thing 
when a team keeps winning championship after championship. Yeah, we were getting older. We had a lot of guys that were getting up there in their careers. Guys were starting to retire. Guys weren't playing as well because, you know, basically Wilkie was 36, 37 years old. Um, just guys were getting older in their careers. So there's no way you can keep that thing together that long. Uh, Hugh Campbell, our head coach, it took off to the USFL right. with the uh, LA Express. He was no longer there anymore. And, and he, was, he was the glue that kept us all together. You know, his nickname was Gluey Huey as a wide receiver where he was the same way. Right with, here in Saskatchewan. Yeah, he was the same way as, a, uh, as our head coach. He knew how to put the right personalities together that worked for that football team. And we made very few changes throughout the time that I was there as far as our core group of players. We brought in some younger players from time to time, of course. You have to do that. But we really knew how to mix and manage all those different personalities and egos that were on our football team. And I think that was another big reason why we were so successful. But once that team started to break up, that's when I knew it was probably time for me to go do something else because I had accomplished so much in such a short period of time up here, it was time for me to you know, go after some other challenges. And I thought I was going to play my whole career up here, believe it or not. That's how much I enjoyed it. But because of all the success and because I, I wanted to be challenged more and see exactly what else I could do as a player, that's what, what made me go back to the National Football League just to see – if I was even good enough to play down there. That's something that was always in the back of my mind because people had told me that I couldn't, and I wanted to prove to them that I could. Well, I want to follow up on that and the move to the NFL. 1982, when the, the run of five came to an end, uh, this man, Warren Moon, became the first, not only in the history of the CFL, the first in the history of pro football, and it was back in a 16-game season, to pass for 5,000 yards. And then... And then did it again in his final year in 1983. The Eskimos did not win the Grey Cup that year, but Warren Moon was named the CFL's most outstanding player in his, uh, his final year up here. And, and, and to follow up on that, Hugh Campbell, head coach of the Houston Oilers in the NFL, after all that success with Edmonton. And you talked about the time being right to try it again. And I'm sure at this point, the NFL wasn't paying much attention when you were a star at Washington. Did you sense they were paying a lot more attention when you were ready to go? Yeah, I was getting a lot more attention uh, after those you know, few years up here in Canada. And um, again, I, I was torn whether I wanted to leave or not. But with Coach Campbell going to Houston and having a guy there that knew me, that knew me as a player, that I knew we'd go through some tough, lean years because they were trying to rebuild a, a, an organization in Houston. And um, just knowing that I had a guy that had my back when we went through those tough times and vice versa, I was going to have his back. It made it a, a very easy choice for me to go play uh, at, for the Houston Oilers. And, and they weren't a very good football team, and I wanted to be a part of something that, uh, that could be, you know, could grow and grow into something. And that's what we were able to do, turn that organization around and become a perennial football, I mean a perennial playoff team. We, we never made the Super Bowl, which is my only regret of playing uh, professional football. But other than that, did much more than I ever thought I would accomplish, uh, given the fact that nobody thought I could ever play the position coming out of college. Yeah, and you did remarkably well. And I don't want to shortchange your NFL career. That's another story entirely. So if I can, we are talking CFL this week to summarize oh, nine Pro Bowl appearances in the National Football League. Nearly 50,000 more yards passing in the NFL to go along with over 21,000 in the CFL. So over 70,000 yards passing in a pro career that continued to be absolutely brilliant once he made the move from the CFL to the National Football League. It is a, uh, I, I just, just one final thought on uh, just a blanket comment on the Canadian Football League and, and what it has meant to you. First of all, it's a, it's a great league. It's been around, most people don't even know it's been here longer than the National Football League. And uh, the thing that I loved about it is I came up here and played in front of fans that cheered me when I did well. They booed me if I was the visitor. Or but not the, here, right? Not here, no. <laughs> None of these people. Well, they booed you because of what you did on the field. Right. And it had nothing to do with anything else. And that was what was so refreshing about playing up here, that I was judged by just the player that I was and the person that I was. It had nothing to do with you know, the color of my skin or where I came from or any of that. So... It really made it refreshing to go to work every day when you, when you lived up here. And some of my best memories are from living here in Canada. My first son was born up here. Um, I have great uh, friendships that I still have up in Edmonton, uh, even to this day. So it was just a great part of my life because I became a man at 21 years old 
when I came up here, and, and from 21 to 27 when I finally left, those were some very, very uh, special years in my life with my family growing at that time, starting off my uh, professional football career, and then playing a position that I loved and being able to flourish at that position. What more can you say about the experience that I had up here in Canada? That's why I'll always love this country. That's beautifully said. Absolutely. And, and I, I congratulate you on the great career you had, and, and thank you for coming up again. The, 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 the message from Athabasca University is achieving success, overcoming obstacles, and you're a wonderful example of that. By the way, Canadian Football Hall of Fame 2004, also a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio, the first ever to do so. Be acknowledged in both leagues. Warren Moon. Thank you. Uh, well, we promised uh, greatness from three different eras. Do you mind if I call up a couple of friends? Yeah, they're younger than me. I'm jealous uh, okay, of Okay, <laughs> well, we'll do it one at a time. And he is younger, and I, I hate to even bring this up. You, you're, the milestone is 70,000 yards um, in, in his wonderful CFL career. He even he even oh, he got that. me, yeah. He, he did. I mean, you two combined are, geez, over 150, 160, close to it. Uh, this man, in case you didn't know, speaking of Halls of Fame, was just announced to the class of 2017 of the Canadian Football Hall of Fame. He'll be inducted this fall. And, and I remember when he started, talk about overcoming obstacles and, and a tough upbringing as well in Los Angeles and overcoming obstacles even in the CFL in his career. I remember him breaking in back in the U.S. expansion era with the Las Vegas Posse and moving on from there to the Hamilton Tiger Cats and still it was his move to the Montreal Alouettes that really launched the career of Anthony Calvillo, Hall of Famer. It's, uh, it's an awful lot of passing yardage sitting here. So, some tired arms, man. <laughs> <laughs> and a and, and couple of guys uh, out of Los Angeles, you heard Warren's story. What was yours and, and, and in the early days? Uh, what were the obstacles that you had to overcome to get to where you are now? Well, I mean, I was born in East Los Angeles, uh, California. And then when I was about five years old, we moved out to La Puente. And uh, it, was, it was great. It was the neighborhood that, that I knew and didn't know anything else. And uh, in our areas, there was gangs and so forth like that. Guys that I grew up got involved in gangs. My brother uh, got involved in gangs and, and spent uh, 10 years in prison for it. But, um, you know, we were always involved in sports. And I think the big thing for us is when our parents separated when we were about 11 years old and uh, things started to get a little crazy and then... I went in one direction playing sports, and my older brother went in another direction. But, you know, he's doing well. I love him and uh, got his life back on track. And, uh, you know, those are the things that I just learned over the years. Okay. Um, Warren got introduced to Canadian football in the hotbed of Edmonton. <laughs> you got introduced to the CFL in the hotbed in a different sort of way of Las Vegas. What was that like? Well, you're 21 years old. Uh, we had our football camp. We actually stayed at the Riviera Hotel on the Las Vegas Strip <laughs> for six weeks. So you have all these young guys. And we actually practiced in the parking lot of the Riviera Hotel as well. So, but again, I'm 21, brand new to any professional sport. So to me, this was all considered normal. My friend Matt Dunnigan, who's on the panel with me, was an understudy of Warren's in Warren's final year in 1983. When, you, when uh, Las Vegas folded up and you ended up going to the Hamilton Tiger Cats, I believe he was one of the quarterbacks anyway, that you were to learn a little bit more from, and he got hurt, and you got thrust into that. Uh, what did it mean after the Thai Cat years, and where did you think your career was when you ended up moving on to Montreal at that particular point in time? Well, I remember I was young, and I was stubborn. Um, I had a chance to learn from Matt Dunnigan, uh, I'm Mike Kerrigan, Steve Taylor, but I didn't really listen to them. And uh, being a young guy, I was competing against these guys, and I ended up beating out a couple of them, and, I just figured if I could beat these guys out, they have nothing to offer me. And it was a huge mistake because in my last year in Hamilton, uh, 1997, we went 2-16. and 16. And those two wins, I didn't even play in those games. So it was very, very difficult. And, you know, I it was kind of like, a, like a, a, um, a very important point in my career. And I ended up going to jail and finally took a step back, started learning and understanding the game. Great. And a guy named Tracy Ham.
Tracy had him around there and a, and a Hall of Famer in his own right, of course. That's it. Um, yeah, things changed. You had a couple of years watching him and then you emerged. And, and I asked you this last night, could, could you have imagined what was still to come and almost a rebirth of your career as an Alouette? Yeah. At that time, just trying to gain the trust of the locker room. That was the biggest thing. I mean, uh, as a quarterback, you need that trust. So I had to develop that, get up and prove to the guys. Yeah. Um, and the way it all capped off, I, I remember too, and, and talk about overcoming obstacles as well. You mentioned all those things, but one other defining moment I remember of your career off the field is taking time away from the game when your wife was ill. You yourself announcing after winning a Grey Cup about your own illness. Um, how has all of that made you stronger, and how has that made you appreciate your journey to where you are today? Well, I think there's a few things that happened in my life that made me relax and understand what's important. One was getting the other was having a first child, but then when your wife is going through cancer and she's fighting for her life, you realize okay, it's fun, but it's not the most important thing in the world. So, uh, so it relaxed me a lot. I was able to go out there and just focus and enjoy the game. And then I died cancer 2010. Same thing. I'm like, this is ridiculous. I'm going to go out there and, and enjoy this game. Thank you very much. <laughs> we, did get, we did get most of that. But, uh, but, but listen, I mean, uh, a three-time Grey Cup champion, uh, we won't mention a couple of uh, the games where you won the Grey Cup. We're just going to... We might put that on hold for a little bit here. That's another, another segment entirely. But you got listen. your heart broken a few <laughs> times, didn't you? Well, no. This, this time it wasn't me. This time, yeah. This time, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, that's... You know what? Well, as I say, we'll... Sorry, we will talk about this a little bit here. But we want to bring out someone else. AC, congratulations. So richly deserved getting into the Hall of Fame as Thank well. Thank you very much, Wonderful, Thank wonderful you. career. The Pro Football's all-time leading passer in just under 80,000 yards. Absolutely uh, remarkable. Well, we do have someone else to bring out, and his passing yardage totals don't quite match up to these two gentlemen, but he has lots of time. And the way he plays, the kind of shape he is in, um, I'm hoping that I get to talk about his Hall of Fame career when he hangs him up Owen around 2037 and gets put into the Hall of Fame. We'll see. Uh, please welcome, he is a Grey Cup MVP, and uh, he has another interesting story to tell as well. Current quarterback of the Edmonton Eskimos, Mike Riley. Mike? That is not disparaging your numbers, which I believe is over 16,000 yards yeah, in your time as a starter. Well, you said 2037. That gives me 20 more years, so I'll be halfway to Calvillo's numbers. By the way. <laughs> Let's be great. I'm excited about that. That's good. I mean, how does it, I mean, I w one of the things I like, I notice this a lot about football, is um, you come into a sport, you come into a league, and, and you tend to appreciate those before you and learn what they've done. I mean, when you arrived in the Canadian Football League, or especially in Edmonton, in the case of Warren Moon, but saw what AC was doing just at the end of his career, how much do you appreciate those who have really helped the evolution of the quarterback position? Oh, there's no question about it. The two guys that are sitting here um, are guys that I've, I've looked up to for a long time. Um, you know, being a kid that grew up in the state of Washington, um, I didn't know anything about the CFL when I was growing up, but I knew a lot about the Seattle Seahawks. So obviously, Warren Moon was the guy that... Uh, we all watched and, and just got super excited every time he was on the field. So um, then to come up into the CFL and get my first chance to start with the Edmonton Eskimos, uh, if you're going to play quarterback in Edmonton, first of all, you're not going to wear number one. No one is. <laughs> no, I guess that one's gone now. Right? And, and secondly, you're going to know who Warren Moon is, and you're going to know yeah. uh, that you're never going to fill those shoes. So you're right. just going to try to try to make your own way. Right. Um, well, if you want to be the greatest 13 ever, by the way, you... you well, know, you that's still... probably unattainable as well. well. I wouldn't but say, I will say... We're not saying that. Just that, saying there's, uh, still, there's still a ways to go, you know, right? I've so... worn 13 forever, and probably because it's always available. Nobody wants to wear it. It's like an agree. You, you number, agree? right? Agree. So yeah. you, you're never going to have to pay a veteran to get that number. <laughs> it's always available. Right. But when I came up here, um, again, I, I was just learning about the CFL, and Montreal was, was on top. They were the team yeah. to try to beat. Um, you know, they had just finished winning their, their second Grey right. Cup in a row. Uh, I heard we're not supposed to talk about those Grey Cups around here. But <laughs> anyway, uh, and I remember seeing 
I'm like, man, this guy is clearly the best in the league, and he also wears 13, so I already like him. Like, you know, he, <laughs> he's doing that wearing that number. He's confident. But, yeah. um, you know, it was, it was a pleasure to be able to watch him play in person. Um, I only got to play against him one time. We lost, of course. But, um, you know, it, these, these guys are, are, you know, the best to have ever played it. And, uh, you know, we, I wouldn't have the opportunity that I had to play in such a strong league if, okay. if they had – what's going on here? Yeah. <laughs> Might need another mic replacement. We'll trying to sabotage me. Not now. you, Mike. <laughs> microphone. But, yeah. They, they got me We're not replacing you. Some yeah. of these TSC <laughs> No, it doesn't have that. Um, yeah. I, uh, they have interesting stories of – you know, inspiring stories of perseverance. So do you. Uh, tell me, like, in the game of football – you know, where people either get, I guess, turned aside or they get fired up uh, by people telling them that they can't do it. What is your story in the game, and, and how much did you have to deal with that, and how did it motivate you? Yeah, I mean, I, I always loved football. That was my favorite sport to play. Um, but when I was growing up as a kid, I was never the most athletic. I, I wasn't the fastest. I wasn't the strongest. Um, so I, I figured out real quick that I just had to work harder than everybody else to try to get to where I wanted to be. And, you know, we moved from Washington to Montana when I was in the middle of high school. So I had to, I had to try to earn a starting job at a new school my senior year. And, you know, I wasn't getting recruited. I walked on at Washington State, was buried on the depth chart, transferred to a small school, tried to make my way through the NFL. I, I, got, to, I got to be a guest in a few locker rooms for a short period of time. Um, and then I was like, I'm going to go up to the CFL because I want to play. And so that was my expectation. And I, I went up to the CFL and found out real quick, nope, you're going to be number four on the depth chart. So, um, wow. But that's what I love about this league, too, is that nothing's given to you right out of the gates. You have to earn everything that you get. And so, you know, I spent three years learning from a, a very good friend and a great player in Travis Lule, and that time helped me to develop. But, you know, that was a rocky point in time, too. I mean, Wally Wano would be the first guy to tell you that he was about to cut me, like, four different times. Yeah, I was going to say, you were <laughs> – did you come down to one play or one drive that you thought might have made the difference? Yeah, for play? sure. I mean, it was in the preseason against Saskatchewan. I think I've told this story a lot. But, um, you know, I, I was in camp as the number three, and then, you know, they bumped a guy in front of me on the depth chart, and I had one opportunity to prove to Wally that I was capable of playing. Um, you know, but that's how it is in our sport, in our business – the you don't know when the opportunities are going to come, and, and honestly, if you, if you don't take advantage of it the first time, you may not get a second chance. So, um, you know, I don't, I don't think my story is much different than anybody else that's played professionally because you've you got to take advantage of that opportunity. Otherwise, you don't, you're not going to be in this league. So uh, you've got to be ready for it, and, um, you know, thankfully I was. But uh, it doesn't change, you know, even though you've battled through all that stuff in the past to get to where you are, in our business, you got to continue to prove it every single year. And so I, I just try to continue with that mentality to be ready for those opportunities. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of the idea of winning five great cups in a row? <laughs> <laughs> it was hard enough to win one. <laughs> sickening. It's very sickening. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, listen, Hall of Famer, Hall of Famer, and I would be shocked if you're not ending up in the Hall of Fame as well, the way your career has been going so far. Mike Riley. Thank you, Mike. If, 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 if the three of you can just spare a few more minutes, there's a few things that I would, I would love to ask you, beginning with uh, where we are, and it's just the perfect place to be. If you're going to come and talk CFL in March and people are going to pay attention, this is just, a, and this is not to knock Edmonton or Montreal or, or any other city, but Saskatchewan has is, is just been fantastic this week. And uh, since none of you played for the Riders, I want to ask you what it was like to come and play against the Riders. What was it like to come to old Mosaic Stadium at Taylor Field, Warren? Yeah, this is one of the places I hated to come play during the season. And it wasn't, it, wasn't so much, it wasn't so much because of their football team. It was more because of these people right here. <laughs> Annoying people right here. I mean, from the time you got into town and got to your hotel, it didn't matter. They were in the in the lobby giving you the business. They're uh, getting off the bus going into the locker room. They're giving you the business. And then when you come out on the field, I mean, it was, what, 35, 39,000 people, but it sounded like it was 80,000 people out there. Then you had to deal with this wind coming off the prairie, you know. Yeah. So me as a passer having to try and throw the ball against this wind. I remember one time uh, Hank Alisic, who we had as a punter at that time, one of the best punters in football, he punted the ball 
and it went up down the field about 20 yards, and then it came back the other way, and ended up being a minus yard punt. I mean, that's how strong that win was. So every time you came into this place, you had to have a strategy of when you had the win at your back, you better score some points, because once it was in your face, you probably weren't going to score. And that was our strategy, to try and get ahead when we had to win at our back and just hold on when we, when we didn't have it. AC? Uh, man, I think Warren got it, got it right. I mean, there's a lot of things you have to be concerned with. And I know for us, we have always had to quiet down all our motions. We like to move people around. But here, it was so loud when the offense was on the field that you could not do a lot of motion. And what's crazy is when Saskatchewan's offense was on, you guys just kept quiet. You could hear a, a pin drop in that thing. So I've always said that you guys were the most intelligent fans crazy fans that you guys are but you're passionate and uh, i always enjoy coming here i really have when well, i didn't <laughs> win no win because i knew that that coming into this uh into this stadium if we won these games it was a hard fought uh, a win not only against the team but also against the fans pick it up mike You've had enough experience coming here. Yeah, no, it's uh, everything these guys have said. I mean, you guys are annoying. I think Warren putting that out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I love coming here, too. I, I love to play in this city um, because that's what gets you excited about football. You know, if you're going to go into a visiting stadium and there's no energy in there, it, you know, it's hard to get amped up and get ready to play. But, you know, the second that you walk on the field, they're going to be yelling and screaming. You're going to feel the ground vibrating. You're not going to be able to hear yourself think. Um, and as a team, you know, kind of as Anthony said, you better be on point because you, you're going to have to use silent count, silent cadence. You're going to have to tone your motions down. Um, but your communication is just non-existent. So if you guys aren't on the same page and you didn't have a locked-in great week of practice, you're not going to be successful. So, it, you know, it's, it's hard enough. It doesn't matter who you're playing. It's hard enough to win a football game every week in this league. Um, and then you add the crowd that you have to battle against and the wind conditions and all of that. Um, you know, it, it's a very tough place to play, but it's a great place to come and, and play a football game. It, it, yeah. Remarkable, absolutely. The fan passion, of course, everything else. And it's funny you talk about the win. We did a game uh, oh, four or five years ago when Chris Milo was kicking, was punting for uh, the Riders. And uh, that win was gusting that day. And you talk about, this is the opposite of Hank Alyssa. He hit the wind at his back, and he hit it well, about 50 yards, and it went over, uh, I think, a Hamilton Tiger Cat return man, and it rolled, and it rolled, and it rolled. It went from one end zone to the other. It went down on the books as a 108-yard punt. I thought it was just going to head all the way across the border. But uh, just one other thought about three Americans coming up to play a Canadian game, used to playing American rules, smaller field, four downs. Uh, what was the biggest adjustment? What did you think of the Canadian game, whether you liked it or didn't like it? What, what was it about the game that you had to adjust it? It was definitely an adjustment because just the philosophy of how you have to attack on defense is totally different with three downs. You know, the running game is not that much involved. But I remember my first preseason game, we were playing against the Ottawa Rough Riders in Edmonton. And I didn't know, you know, all the different things that had happened in this league or, or were going to happen in this league. And I remember at the end of the game, it was a close game, and I think um, – Ottawa could have kicked the field goal to beat us. You know, all they needed, I think, was one point or something like that. And they kicked the field goal, and he missed it. And our return guy, I think it was Larry Highball, believe it right. or not, at the time, he punted the ball back out of the end zone. I'm like, what is he doing? <laughs> Welcome to and, Canadian and football. And then one of their guys caught it, and he punted it back into the end zone. <laughs> and then he caught it again, and he ran it back out of the end zone. And I didn't know what had just happened right there. I learned a lot about the game on that one play. And we won the football game because they didn't score that point. But I'm like, what in the heck am I, am, am I involved in here? But I love the game because of all the different ways you can score. The game moves really fast as far as the time clock. Uh, there's so many good things about it that they need to adapt uh, in the National Football League and some of the stuff that they, they have already adapted. But I think there's more of the rules from this league that could be adapted to the NFL to uh, make it a faster game. Interesting. How, how about you, AC? That's great. Um, I think the biggest thing for me was just the size of the field and, and the guys motioning all over the place. That's the one thing that kind of just got me like, okay, what's going on here? But other than that, it was still playing football. It was still doing the things you did growing up throwing the ball to guys, uh, throwing to the receivers, scoring touchdowns. So to me, it was just the size of the field 
and all these crazy motions that you're allowed to do. Found it strange coming up? Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I still find something strange <laughs> up here. But, uh, <laughs> um, I mean, the kick out stuff is crazy. I don't yeah. even, I still don't really understand all of that <laughs> stuff. But, uh, um, you know, for me, the, the 12th man, the extra guy is one of the big things just because of what it allows defenses to do. Um, you know, and I played for Chris Jones, and now he's here, and he's one of the best innovators in terms of and, and most annoying people to practice against because you're playing skelly you're passing skelly you know you got seven guys and he's dropping 11 of his defenders and skelly you're like what are you doing but they can run so many different coverages that you got to be really good at, at not just pre-snap stuff but you have to be able to make decisions on the field and get through your progressions and that's the other part about it is with only three downs as the quarterback the only way you're going to be successful is if you're an efficient player. You have to you have to be able to move the chains consistently. Field position is so big in our game, and you know I didn't get to watch Warren play up here, but watching Anthony, that's what I I always couldn't understand how he would be reading one side of the field and it's not there, and it was like a no look flick to his back out of the backfield on the other side, and the guy's going for like 20 yards, and I'm like, well, that must be nice to be able to do that. So. Um, <laughs> You know, but it, it's it's hard as a quarterback. There's there's a lot of changes that you have to get used to. But again, as Anthony said, it's still football. It's still drop back, yeah. read the defense, and throw a ball, and let's go score. Well, on behalf of uh, an old football fan loving Canadian football, I'm glad all three of you came, and I'm glad you all stayed as long as you did before uh, finding other greatness in the National Football League too. But three great ambassadors for what the CFL has meant in the past and the present and looking ahead to the future as well. Warren Moon, Anthony Calvillo, and Mike Riley. And I might also say thank you all. Thank you. Uh, I'm also pleased to uh, say there is another big football fan here as well. The Premier, Brad Wall, wants to come up and, uh, and say a word as well to these guys here, Mr. Premier. Hey, that's hey, ridiculous. Hey, Come hey, on, hey, we're, hey, not, we're not in the right. field right now. How are you doing, Anthony? How are you doing, Mr. Moon? Good to see you. Man. Good to see you. Uh, if I could just say very, very quickly, on behalf of the province, how grateful we are to the league uh, for uh, bringing this event here this week. Uh, I just want to say this. So the CFL, in many respects... Thanks, Anthony. The CFL is defined by distance. Um, the distance between our sidelines, the distance between our goal lines, and the great distance between our CFL cities. But there's a more important measure, a more important distance that we all noted very well here on the stage, and that's the short distance between the players, legends, and the fans. I think that's unique to our league, and it's, it's because of you guys that that's the case. I just also want to point out that for me, a defining moment, the most poignant moment as a CFL fan, was when you, Warren Moon, made your speech at Canton, when you were inducted into the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and the very first thing you said was to thank Canada and to thank the CFL for the chance to play a professional quarterback. And you know, there is only one undrafted quarterback in Can at Canton in that Hall of Fame. It's Warren Moon, and I think CFL fans in Canada can take some credit for that. So to all of you, thanks for your example. And thanks to the commissioner, his amazing team, the Board of Governors and the CFL for choosing Regina for this. We hope we get you back another year. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr. Premier. Uh, as a final thought, I know Mike Riley has been signing autographs this week already. He's been signing autographs for Ryder fans, which is pretty interesting. That shows you how big fans they are. Uh, once May hits, I don't sign that color of green. But, <laughs> but it's March, so we'll let it slide. And, and, and to speak to the, the character of Anthony Calvillo as well, one diehard Ryder fan told me today, can't stand the Montreal Alouettes, the memories of 09 and 10, but how could you not like AC? So that's, that's nice there. <laughs> And you've had a chance to, to sign as well, but uh, Warren Moon, and I know a lot of you would love to get a signature from Warren Moon, who will be signing autographs in a moment. Thank you all for this. It's been a real pleasure.